Welcome to this session on the future of banking and the future of mankind. Because you have to be aware that some significant changes in our monetary system are in the pipeline. And some of them are not all good. So we have to be aware of the risks and also the potential and the task at hand. Roughly 90% of central banks currently pursue central bank digital currency projects, said a McKinsey study. So get ready for something new that will change the world. It has the potential to change the world, not just for the better. So please pay attention. So what's new about central bank digital currencies. We're being told it's the digital aspect. That's what the European Central Bank has emphasized. It's a digital euro. There are digital currencies out there like Bitcoin, blockchain currencies. So the central bank wants to offer uh, its own version, we're told. So allegedly, it's the digital aspect that is new. Is that actually true? Yes, Bitcoin has been a digital project, but actually most payments are digital, and the payments we've been doing for half a century. Direct debit, bank cards, credit cards, Apple Pay, Google Pay, Monzo Revolut, prepay cards. It's all digital. We have been using BDC, bank digital currency for decades. So what's really new? It's the central aspect, CBD, C, central bank digital currencies. It's the central aspect and therefore we need to pay attention. Why do we need to centralize our monetary system? The fact is the central planners want more power and is this justified? Should we give them more power yet again? How have they used the power we've given them in the past? The central bankers claim that they will not abuse the power that central bank digital currencies will give them. Well, let's see what else McKinsey, this um, cerebral management consulting firm, is saying about CBDCs. They're saying that actually there's no good reason to introduce CBDCs. Of course, in McKinsey talk, there's this, there's no substantiated market value proposition for CBDCs <laughs> that can be documented. The benefits seem to be limited. Now, these are the benefits for us. They certainly are limited. But the benefits to the central planners are enormous. And that is why you hear about CBDCs a lot and the rollout. McKinsey also says that trust remains a hurdle for a meaningful, meaningful share of citizens and system participants. And McKinsey says that people question the motives behind CBDCs. McKinsey says that people often suspect that governments are actually aiming at monitoring and restricting financial activities. Can we keep the, the lights on here, please? I mean, I'm quite used to the lights being switched off and the microphone being switched off when I criticize the central bankers. Uh, so this is just in style. And thirdly, McKinsey says, technical challenges exist and CBDCs may not actually overcome these technical challenges in the short term. So, and then you suddenly realize maybe it's not such a good idea to introduce CBDCs. Do we really need them? Um, recently, um, in the blockchain world, 
a programmer in Brazil has proven that the Brazilian CBDC pilot contains the code to freeze your money and take your money. Now, that's not surprising. It's just nice that it's documented because it gets denied a lot by the central planners. So that's a fact, and we shouldn't be surprised by this. Also, just remember what happened in Canada just a few years ago. There were demonstrations in the capital city of Canada, in Ottawa, and these were wholly peaceful demonstrations. There's no real doubt about that. But the demonstrators opposed the very strict and um, meddlesome government policies in a peaceful way, as you have the right in a democracy to do. Now, Prime Minister Trudeau really didn't like this, the protests kept going on, and he wanted to get the protesters off the streets. He didn't like any demonstrations against his policies. So what happened? A law was passed very quickly. And you see, because CBDCs have not yet been rolled out in Canada, they had to pass a law. And that law enabled the government to do what CBDCs will be able to do without passing laws, without parliamentary debate, without even d democratic institutions being involved at all. Namely, to freeze the assets of the people demonstrating peacefully against the government. Their faces were recognized through facial recognition software, and their bank accounts were frozen, their debit cards were frozen, their credit cards were frozen, even, dare we say it, uh, PayPal and Bitcoin. According to the police report, 253 Bitcoin addresses with virtual currency exchanges were also frozen, um, freezing in total $3.8 million. The fact is the demonstrators hadn't brought enough cash with them, and they couldn't even buy water or food. So the demonstrations were over within two days. That's how they ended. And that gave us a great glimpse into what CBDCs are about. Because, of course, you can use other excuses. This is the ideal system to combine with digital IDs, and then you can run social credit scores, as we've heard from China. And, of course, the arguments and the um, the parameters in the credit scoring can be anything the government desires. Maybe it's going to be the climate. The fact is, the central bankers, the central planners, have now stepped out of the shadows to the front of the stage, and that's why we have a right to discuss this and demand some proper debates about this, because the central planners are about to usurp parliamentary powers, literally, because the power to um, intervene in people's payments and also the power to spend newly created uh, money on different government spending programs is fundamentally a fiscal government parliamentary prerogative that the central planners are now trying to grab. And that will mean the end of democracy if, you know, that hasn't happened already, but... <laughs> The central planners are also breaking up this centuries-old concordat, this agreement between the central banks and the banks, namely for banks to mainly speak to the public and the accounts are with the public, and the central bank deals with the banks. That's going to end once you introduce CBDCs, and the umpire, the referee of the game, the regulator of the banks, the central bank, is going to compete directly with the banks. And then when you just get the first banking crisis, all deposits will move from the banking system to the central bank, and you have eliminated all competition. There will be only one bank left in town, the central bank. So this is literally the biggest upheaval in our monetary system in 330 years. Um, we don't have time to listen to this actually very short a one-minute clip. Just search for it on the internet. 
Agustin Carstens is his name. He's managing director of the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements. And it's the clip with this background where he says what actually is cash and what is CBDC because it's not just digital cash. CBDCs are different. With cash, we don't know who's spending the money on what and we can't stop them. Well, with CBDCs, we can do this and we have both the right and the power and the technology to do it. That's what he's saying. And to top it, the BIS just announced a few months ago that they want a digital ledger for all assets. Assets should become tokenized, which in principle, you know, if you're interested in blockchain, sounds like a great idea. But listen who is wanting to do it. It's the central planners. They want everything on the digital ledger. For what? Well, it will be more efficient to exert their power to transfer ownership of assets and also prevent you from getting assets, uh, access to your assets. Um, and of course, the programmability is that feature giving them this power. It's a matter of public record. The Bank of England has officially asked the UK government to give the go-ahead on the programmability feature of the digital pound, and it's the same in other countries. So it is about controlling and intervening, not just monitoring and total surveillance. It's one step beyond that is actually the intervention uh, in people's transactions, giving the issue of CBDCs control over how and whether it is spent by the recipient. Now, one excuse is likely to be the climate um, agenda. MasterCard already has a tool to automatically give you a score of your CO2 or otherwise carbon or uh, climate um, exposure. And if you're above your limit, your budget, sorry, your CBDC, your, your account is not working anymore. That can be um, implemented. Now, let's quickly look at this idea. So basically, the central planners are asking us to give them more power. And I must say, yet again, because we have given them a lot of power in the past. The ECB and the central planners don't really have a great record. Their power has been abused. Um, they've acted in ways to further increase their central powers. That's been the one consistent pattern of their behavior in the past half century as they became independent and more powerful. Let me very quickly take you through a presentation I gave at hedge fund conferences a whole 20 years ago where I warned of the rise of central planners becoming too powerful. And as a result, I warned we will get more boom and bust cycles, we will get more banking crises, and we get more intervention as these central planners essentially maximize their power. You see, after each crisis, they ask for more powers, and we give it to them. So they actually benefit from each crisis. It's regulatory moral hazard. And we shouldn't be surprised that the frequency of crises has increased, and the amplitude of business cycles has increased. Now, you could say, oh, that's... With hindsight, you can easily say this. Well, I said this 20 years, 20 years ago. Have a look. I call it the specter of central bank risk, where most investors don't realize what risk they're taking because they assume the central planners want to do what they claim they want to do, namely, oh, stable currencies, stable prices, stable economic growth, stable, stable, stable. It's in their speeches. They always talk about stability. What's the empirical evidence? Have they ever delivered stability of anything? There's no empirical evidence to support this. Since they've become legally independent and more powerful, actually, we've been given the opposite. Greater cycles, um, more frequent cycles. So business cycles have increased in frequency and amplitude, and that is the central bank risk that has increased, that the central planners may actually intentionally 
maximize their power, as the theory of bureaucracy says, and to do that, they may intentionally maximize the frequency and amplitude of cycles, including creating banking crises. Uh, the business cycle had been pronounced dead 20 years ago, and I said, no, it's not dead at all. Um, we have continuation of these cycles. They're just bigger, and then people didn't recognize it. Okay, here's what the central bankers say. We have nothing to do with these cycles. To the contrary, we're working against cycles. We want stability. Okay, that's a nice claim. Let's look at the facts. The official story is that central banks aim at price, economic, and currency stability. To do this, they use interest rates, as you will have heard many times. And they do that through interest rates, because interest rates are supposed to be the key variable that drives the economy. Well, let's check these three claims step by step. Let's start with interest rates. So we're told that lower rates lead to higher growth, and higher rates lead to lower growth. Well, where's the empirical evidence? There actually isn't any. If you look at the facts, um, what you see is a positive correlation between interest rates and growth. And in terms of timing, growth happens first and interest rates follow. Now you can say, well, that was 20 years ago, but surely now things have finally panned out. Um, well, actually, I just published a study of um, one is of four countries looking at half a century, the other is of 19 countries. And you must be aware that all the different schools of economic thought, you know, economists always arguing, they all have different views, but they all agree on one thing, and this is what it is. They agree on, the, on this alleged rule, on this interest rate thesis, that lower rates lead to higher growth, and higher interest rates lead to lower growth. That's the interest rate thesis. It is essentially the law and the profits of equilibrium economics. They agree on this, and so you think, got to be true. But how many studies actually exist showing this? And they've been saying this for 70 years, really, essentially on a daily basis, whether it's central bankers, economists, researchers, journalists. Well, how many studies are there proving this? Zero. There is not a single study. To the contrary, as I showed um, with um, very good econometrician, Kang Suk Lee, who works at the Luxembourg Central Bank. Um, you can look it up, you can Google it, it's open source, but it's published in a peer-reviewed, highly ranked uh, journal, Reconsidering Monetary Policy. There's a second one with 19 countries uh, in this journal, International Journal of Finance and Economics. What we found was, just to cut to the chase, is a positive correlation. Of course, you do this very carefully. You have to check for the leads and lags. It's a a uh, dynamic conditional correlation gauge model. And we found that virtually all the time, you know, this is above the zero line, the correlation in all these countries for half a century between interest rates and growth is positive. Positive. So higher growth, higher rates. Lower growth, lower rates. That is the empirical fact. And what about causation? We found that causation, causation runs in the opposite direction. It is from growth to interest rates. So the official story is false in both dimensions. And, and really, we've learned to live with this cognitive dissonance, because you could have checked the data, and you will have seen some of that data um, in the past. Instead of high rates slowing the economy, low rates stimulating the economy, the reality is high growth leads to high rates, low growth leads to low rates. Why did interest rates rise? since last, last year, autumn, because they boosted nominal growth like crazy. How? Well, what is actually driving the economy? It's not interest rates. What is it? Well, it's not the price of money. Prices are dominant in this theoretical fictional world of equilibrium, which doesn't exist. In reality, all markets are rationed, and quantities dominate. It's not the price of money, it's the quantity of money. And the quantity of money measured by credit creation, because it's created by banks. Banks create money. So we, we found that this claim is just not true. Interest rates are not the key variable. Is it true that central banks really use interest rates as their key monetary policy tool? 
Um, well, I made a proposal in 1995, published in the main newspaper in Japan, the Nihon Keizai Shimbun, the Nikkei, um, after which the Nikkei stock index is named, which I called quantitative easing. I mean, you will recognize it here, if you can read the Chinese characters in Japanese, Keiki Gaifuku, Ryo Tiki Kinyu Kamakara. That was my original proposal. Um, it became very popular with central banks, but the Bank of Japan took took a decade sort of to warm up to this. Uh, they also s distorted this somewhat, but that's another story. We don't have time for these details. So the fact is they have been using quantity policies. Now, not just since my proposal of QE, quantitative easing, um, but actually <laughs> I could show that most central banks have engaged in off-the-record, informal guidance of bank credit, and that's how the economy is run. Um, and we saw it again in 2008 and in 2020, which explains the current inflation. And if you compare these two, um, my proposal of QE was to get out of the crisis quickly without cost to the taxpayer. And you can do this if the central bank buys non-performing assets from banks, you've cleaned up the banking system, and the central bank buys performing assets from non-banks. That's how you create a lot of money, push it into the economy. Uh, the Bank of Japan has refused for a long time to do it. The Fed did it in 2008. Um, it actually... Yes, there. Um, as bank credit, the gray line collapsed. The Fed massively um, expanded, but only in the banking sector by purchasing non-performing assets of the banking system. This doesn't create inflation. It doesn't weaken the dollar, as I pointed out at the time. So most people got this wrong. No inflation from this. But then in 2020, they implemented my second part of my QE, which I had designed for a deflationary Japan that was shrinking. The economy was shrinking. Um, deflation, banking bust. Um, and it's a, it's a way to reflate out of this deflation, namely for the central bank to purchase assets from non-banks, which forces the banks to create credit and pushes it through the banking system into the economy. And that's what they did um, in March 2020. Massive amounts. But there was no deflation. Bank credit growth is already very strong, around 5-6%. So they boosted it to double-digit growth. And of course, that had to be inflationary. And that's what they did. Um, and so we know, um, of course, they can do it. I mean, they have implemented my proposal in the end. It's just not really when it was necessary in Japan. But when it was unnecessary, and they, therefore, we can show, created this inflation on purpose. Um, and by the way, we know this is created by, um, on purpose. And this is exactly what they did, because they announced it. If you go back to August uh, 2019, BlackRock made that proposal at the Jackson Hole conference and they said, when the next crisis comes, we must create inflation and here's how we're going to do it. And they had my QE2 proposal. And then, in March 2020, how do we know they adopted the BlackRock proposal? Because the Fed hired BlackRock to do it. It's official. Look it up. All right. So the last point is, central banks claim they aim at price, economic, and currency stability. I mean, the other claims are not true, and this one is obviously not true either, because there's no empirical evidence for that whatsoever. What they are delivering is business cycles. So, I mean, there's much more here, but I'm, I'm, I really don't have very much time. But I pointed out already 20 years ago that we're giving too much power to these central planners, and we need to decentralized power. And the way to do this is to make sure we have a decentralized money creation. I mean, there's the Bitcoin alternative. But also, we should not forget that we have allies in decentralized finance, and these are small local banks. We need to create small local banks, a decentralized system. Um, countries that have been very successful are characterized by having many, many banks, especially small banks, because they lend to small firms. They account for most employment. That gives an economy where you have less inequality, you get higher reinvestment um, and high growth. Um, and that's really what we need to do. As Lord Acton said, 
It's easier to find people to govern themselves than people to govern others properly without corruption. Um, and that means a decentralized system. You want to decentralize the money creation. Um, I'm doing that by setting up community banks and by buying banks. If you want to help me, there's some cheap small banks in Europe for sale at the moment. I'm trying to buy them for 10 million, 20 million each. And also the Valhalla network, uh, where we have a blockchain network with token and a decentralized um, um, organization uh, for governments, and we are setting up community banks. And don't forget, don't give more power to the central planners. Power corrupts, and this absolute power that it, CBDCs would give them can only do what Lord Acton warned, corrupt absolutely. So thank you very much. Um, I've got more here, but you know, perhaps we have time later. Thanks. Oh, and one more thing. I will give a part two speech um, tomorrow um, at FinTech Search. All right. <laughs> See you there. Thanks very much. Any questions? Can we take questions? <laughs> no, we're a little bit yeah. short of time, All but right, thank thanks. you so much. Round of applause, please, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Richard. Brilliant. Thank you. Excellent. It's nice to see you here, by the way, and here in the exchange.